Welcome to Zeitgeist Radio. I'm your host, Morgan Rowe, founder of the Zeitgeist Academy. Zeitgeist means spirit of the times, and it is the collection of cultural forces that all contribute to what it feels like to be alive and part of a dynamic culture. Every episode, I speak with someone from a unique musical subculture. We dig into their passion and explore how music is a powerful force that brings people together. Before we dive into today's interview, I want to offer you something special. If you're like me, you come out of these interviews with all sorts of questions. Each week, after speaking with one of our amazing guests, I dive into something they introduced us to that I find interesting or important. I write a blog post about it and email a nice tidy bundle to your inbox every two weeks. Never miss an exploration of an awesome musical subculture. Join the Academy and sign up for my free newsletter at zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. My guest today is Lindsay Dono, a contra dancer and caller out of Washington State. All right, Lindsay, welcome to Zeitgeist Radio. I'm so excited you're here. Thanks for inviting me. Really glad to have this opportunity. Yeah. So I've known you and danced with you for, I don't even know, probably over 10 years. <laughs> but I've never had the chance to just sit down and pick your brain. Um, you've had quite the journey with um, this hobby that we both do. And I'm so looking forward to di uh, diving in, digging in and kind of seeing like, I feel like this whole world is something that like, like there's like this whole underworld, like of of this hobby that I do so so before we get too deep into that can you tell people like um kind of who you are and then what what you do what is contra dance sure so by day I am a user experience researcher and I work in the tech industry and the rest of the time I am involved in this niche hobby called contra dance and my role is both a dancer and also that of what is known as a color, someone who leads the dancing in real time. Nice. So people ask me, I've been doing contra dance since I was like eight, like a long time. Um, and I always kind of struggle when people ask, like, what is it? I'm like, oh, I do contra dancing. What is that? So I'd be really curious. How do you answer that question when you get asked what contra is? So it turns out the hardest part of contra dance is actually describing it. It's so true. Dancing. It's so true. So there have been so many pages written and efforts put into trying to describe what is contra dance and you know, to come up with that succinct elevator pitch. So I'll give you a couple and they'll some are a little bit more serious than others. And and we can kind of work through those. So a really basic description is it's a type of American folk dance. And then, okay, what is a folk dance, actually? Well, it's a type of participatory dance that is a vernacular recreational expression of a past or present culture, and that's the Encyclopedia Britannica definition. It's pretty dry, right? Another way to describe it might be increasingly fancy ways of walking in patterns with other humans at about 118 beats per minute. <laughs> I like that one. That's good. <laughs> Moving even further down the spectrum of silliness, Jane Austen goes square dancing to river dance. Okay. Hey, that's good too. <laughs> My personal elevator pitch, though, is that contra dance is the most efficient use of your time because it provides three things simultaneously. And that's your physical activity, mm -hmm. your cognitive stimulus, and your social interaction. And yes. breaking all that down is you show up in an event, you may or may not know anybody, you'll dance somewhere between 10 to 12 dances, you'll get your 10,000 steps in, Yep, and you'll walk away with a whole bunch of new friends. That is every single word you said is so true. <laughs> I, I usually describe it as uh, most people kind of sort of know what square dancing is. Um, and there is totally a whole square dance community of which I am not typically part of. So uh, and most most people didn't particularly have a good time square dancing. So I will typically say it's like if square dancing were fun and smiling people are coming at you for three hours and that's all you need to know about it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, everybody has, I mean, square dance, 
can also mean I didn't a lot mean, of I don't mean to actually diss on square dance. It's just, it's not a very, like, it is not always super beginner friendly. Um, and it's taught to kids for some reason. It's, well, there's, there's a whole interesting history around that, why it's taught to kids in middle school. Uh, but it's not typically an enjoyable time. I have yet to meet someone who genuinely loved square dancing in middle school. Yeah. And that's often why I avoid trying to make that reference. But yeah. It's the one that often seems to help the most, at, at least communicating the form. Yeah. But what it really doesn't communicate is the energy or culture. Yes. Or particularly the music. Yes. I like the one that you said about River, like Jane Austen meets River Dance. That's pretty good. <laughs> Um, so when did you start contra dancing? How long have you been doing it? So I actually just celebrated my contra half life, which means I've been dancing contra more than half my life. And nice. I, I won't give you a number on that. No, that's fine. I, that's fine. Yay. Um, <laughs> I started later than you, actually. I didn't realize you had started so young. I was in yeah. high school and a number of my friends had, high school friends had been participating in a, another niche hobby, uh, sheep note singing. Ah, and yes. And there, all of these different folk cultures, you know, overlap and, you know, oftentimes whichever one you start with ends up being a gateway to explore all these other folk traditions. And so they said, well, you know, our sheep note group often does this dance thing and, and we think you'd like it and you should come. And so they dragged me to a dance. I was living in the Massachusetts area. And they took me to a dance that no longer exists. But um, of course, we were you know, classic teenagers. We showed up in the second half when, you know, typically at a contra dance, the it's choreography starts very uh -huh. sick and scales up until about halfway through the event and then scales back down as people get tired. So we showed up just at the apex of complexity. <laughs> um, I remember being horrifically dizzy and getting completely lost in my face for Christmas. Yes. Yes. And I Man, after COVID, my first dance back, my face hurt from smiling again. Like it's, it's, it's intense. It's literally just smiling people and you are one of them coming at other people for three hours. It's, yeah. Oh, yeah. so, but you and stayed after all of that. <laughs> I did. And I danced, danced, you know, opportunistically throughout high school and college and it was in college that I was handed a carded choreography oftentimes dance choreography is written out on, on index cards and the person who handed me the card says I'm curating an open mic in two weeks and I think you should try calling a dance and for those of you who are newer to contra dance what does calling a dance actually mean um, it turns out that you have to participate in this style of dance somebody needs to tell you what to do. And so it hadn't really been anything that I'd thought about. And so I looked at the card and go, hmm, I, I don't know what a lot of these words mean. And there's a bunch oh, no. of funny numbers on the side. Oh, no. <laughs> so I, I asked a lot of questions and I found I had lots of recordings of contra music because, yeah, something that I'm hoping we'll get to discuss a little bit later is how fabulous the music is. Yes. And how complex the music can be. And sat down and, and learned how to count out jigs and reels and got up at the microphone and nobody caught on fire. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're so brave. I've again I've I've been dancing since I was eight. I also won't share how long that is, but it's a while. And I would be still, I just would feel so intimidated. Calling would be like just all the pressure, all of the pressure. Um, and I guess to to also share for people who don't know um, anything about contra dance, uh, you really don't have to know anything. Like you really mm -hmm. don't. People are like, oh, I'm I'm I have two left feet, or I I can't keep a beat, or I don't know how to dance. None of that matters. None of that matters. Generally, move in the right place. Someone tells you what to do the whole time, and that is the caller. Um, so. Again, I'm I'm uh I'm so interested that you just learned. That's so cool that you just jumped in and learned how to call <laughs> without. Oh man, let's add an open mic. That's so great. Yeah, that was definitely one of my questions. Was how did you decide to try calling for the first time? Um, 
I, I didn't. Other people really, um, yeah. I, there, there was no initiative on my part at all. Yeah. I was basically a path just opened up in front of me. And this particular caller who's in the Portland area named Rich Goss decided that I was also going to be a caller <laughs> and I had nothing to do with this decision. That's and so after the first experience had invited me to call one of, you know, typically there are 12 dances in an evening when he was calling and invited me to do it again. And the next time said, how about two dances? Nice. And they went, Ugh, that's really pushing it. <laughs> and I did it anyway. <laughs> And at the next point, one of the organizers of a dance in Seattle said, oh, you should pair, we should, we should pair you with a senior caller who's you know, quite experienced and work you up to doing chassis. And I went, absolutely not. And then did it anyway. I'm sensing so, a pattern. <laughs> so on and so forth. And I just found myself you know, doing that calming thing. Without really yeah, what do you having... what do you like about calling? What what grabs you? I think it's creating those moments of magic that I've experienced on the dance floor for other people. And I there's something that's called dance trance. Oh, you're just in the moment. You're yeah. grooving. You're you're connecting with the music. You're connecting with your partner. You're connecting with all the other dancers around you who you're interacting with, and everything's you're in that flow state. And I think the most profound thing for me about being a caller or a leader in the community is how do I create that magical experience for others and how do I bring people together? Yeah. And part of being a caller is connecting all the pieces that create that magic moment. And what's great is that knowing the magic, knowing the, I guess the technicalities behind the scene doesn't remove the magic as a dancer or even watching that magic unfold nice. but it is so compelling to me to be able to create those moments for others yeah I I as a dancer I know exactly like some of the moments I can picture um you know what what those and dance trance I like that and that's so true um you just kind of like there's this magic where you lose track of there's no time there's just moving and smiling and moving <laughs> and moving and spinning <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, what's the biggest event you've ever called? Biggest in terms of number of dancers or? Uh, whatever, whatever. So that's what I was thinking, but, um, yeah, whatever, whatever you feel like the answer to that question is. The Northwest Folklife Festival, which is in Seattle, at peak capacity holds perhaps 600, 650 dancers. And the really unique thing about that festival is that it is a free event open to the public. So in terms of crafting a user experience, you have your really dedicated, deeply involved dancers who have traveled from out of town to, I've jokingly heard it called the high holy days of contra dance, <laughs> that they are at sure. the festival yeah. specifically to dance. And you have people who showed up to the festival because it's Memorial Day weekend and it was a thing to do. And all of a sudden, somebody off the floor, who might actually be me, walks up and says, hey, would you like to dance? And they say, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know how to dance. And I say, no, 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 don't worry. Um, you you walked over to me. That's all the skills you need. Smile. Yep. You'll figure the rest of it out. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. And just for perspective, how many people do you think that dance floor holds up there? Again, about 650 at top. Uh, we've some people who are even nerdier than I am have, have actually calculated this or run the numbers based on uh, in contra dance, you line up in formations and you, looking at a, just even a photo or a video, mm -hmm. you can pretty quickly estimate what the floor capacity will hold. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple events that get a little bit larger than that. Uh, the Dance Flurry in upstate New York and the New England Folk Festival in Massachusetts, I think, end up slightly higher than that. Wow. But those, as far as I know, are really the biggest events in terms of number of people. Yeah, I have been to Folk Life many, many times, and it is 
it is just so it is so fun. <laughs> High holy days. Um, so when you decide, let's go back to calling. Um, when you decide, okay, this is something I'm doing. I can do a whole night now. Like I can be the caller for a dance. Um, how do you connect? Like you must still have influences and mentors and people that you, um, I guess I'm wondering like, what's the type of community, the caller community? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you guys get together? There's a lot of, con I, I know that there are conversations that happen, but I don't know how those happen or when or where. Lots of formats. I'll start little and I'll zoom out. Okay. Well, so much is just word of mouth and in-person community of someone comes up to you and asks a question of, you know, you're the caller for the evening. And somebody says, I really liked the choreography of this particular dance. Would you share it with me? And you say, oh, here's the, here's the index card. And they'll take a picture of it on their phone. And now they have it. And so there's that very organic, you know, communication that happens. And that can be just from somebody walking up to you. It can be at, and, and something that Contra really enables is community. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just what happens on the dance floor. There ends up being opportunities to connect either before a dance, after a dance. Um, dancers end up you yeah. going to afters, which could be at somebody's house. It could be at a restaurant that's out in late, et cetera. Or we end up being friends and we just do things off the dance floor and those conversations can happen there. Sometimes it can be a little bit more intentional of, I have a specific question and I think I know who might know the answer. And I've found that um, people are just extraordinarily generous with their time. And I can reach out to various experienced callers and say, hey, I've got this question and it might be really silly. And it's something that I definitely did a lot of as I was building my skill set. And I still do. Is there like a repository of dances because the more experienced dancers um often are also callers but um you know I'll be dancing with someone and they'll just they'll know the dance like within the first I mean sometimes it's like the first two moves that are like super common moves and all of a sudden you know here's William Watson pointing me in the right direction I'm like how did you know that was coming um so is there like is there a repository of of centralized dances? You mentioned these index cards. Um, also, um, attribution is usually given to the people who write them. How do you keep all of that straight? So many good questions. And as I was describing, you know, just how I connect with other callers, there's a, there's a organic connections at events and you know, at dance camps or other dance events. There's also a big online community. And this is something that's obviously wasn't the case 50 years ago. Yeah. There are various caller networks. Um, there's a mailing list called Shared Weight, which for those in the Contra scene, sharing weight is a way of connecting with people. So there's a little internal joke there. And choreography has historically been shared there. People, Some people prefer to, choreographers prefer to publish their dances in books and had encouraged you to buy the books. Increasingly, as, as everything has moved online, you can just do a web search, or if you know the title of the dance, look it up. There might be a YouTube video, and even better, the YouTube video might have somebody teaching it and give you all the tips. Um, I can also make a plug for the database created mostly by Chris Page called The Colors Box, and it is a searchable database online and Chris has meticulously collected and cataloged more than 14,000 unique contra dances. And it is now a searchable public free database. And that has completely revolutionized how we find choreography or share it. Yeah. That's so awesome because uh, I know people, I mean, have you written a dance? Yes. Yes. Ah, that's so cool. <laughs> Um, and I know, I know other good friends of mine in the community have written dances too. And it's like, okay, well then what? <laughs> so, yeah. And, and that's that it's an interesting thing of, of why choreographer is a slightly different role than caller. Oftentimes yeah. they overlap. 
It blows um, my mind. Is it just, it's like, it's just, it's math, right? So much math. Can you, can you describe, I guess, before we, before we move on from that, can you describe the structure of a contra dance? Totally. So I like to, to give it an analogy of it's a sonnet. There's a very particular form, pattern, meter to how a dance and actually how to how the tunes that go with contra dances are structured. Yeah. They are typically, but not always, 64 beats long. And there are four parts. There's an A1 part, an A2 part, and the tune will repeat A1 into A2. And then you'll have a B1 and a B2 part. And again, the tune will repeat within that as well. And then you'll come back to the top. If you're playing at what we would call dance tempo, that choreographic framework needs to fit in those 64 beats of music. And within that, there are some soft rules for what needs to happen. There is a particular move called a swing. Um, in a modern contra dance, you absolutely must swing your partner sometime during those 64 beats. Most often, you also want to do that same move, a swing with your neighbor. And typically in a part in a contra dance, you will keep your partner and you will move up or down the formation to a new set of neighbors one time through the dance. So in addition to those couple of move requirements, there's also, it's like a game of chess, you need to move to a certain position. Beyond those rules, you can do pretty much anything. And the bigger question is, should you? Yes. <laughs> and you certainly you can use any sort of random word generator to write a sonnet. It may or may not be a pleasant sonnet. And so there's certainly a lot of art that goes into putting together choreography that achieves goals beyond those basic couple goals. How much do you take, um, like, the music into account? So, like, is, okay, is the music always at a certain uh, tempo? It's usually within a certain range. And something that an experienced band can do is they can match their tempo to where the dancers are and also to the feel of the dance. And so there's language that I'll use to communicate with the band of what I'm looking for in a dance. And something that's also unique about Contra within the folk music umbrella is that there is organic pairing of tunes to dances. And so part of that creating that, that magic moment or creating a story arc across an evening of dance is figuring out what the flavor of a dance is and figuring out how to pair music with the dance. And so... It's actually a conversation between the caller and the band about what sort of mood and energy you're trying to create. Mm, that's so cool. Can you give me an example of what that conversation might look like? There are workshops about how callers talk to bands and how bands talk to callers. And in something that is absolutely fascinating is that it is a different conversation with a different vocabulary with every single musician ever. And part of working for the first time with a new band or a new musician is learning what dialect they're speaking in terms of trying to figure out what I want. And it'll depend very, very, very much on the band. So I'll give you two extremes. There is the band that really likes to look at my dance card and at choreography. And there are particular moves that are more or less percussive. And they want to match the percussive bits in the music mm -hmm. to the percussive bits in the dance. And so with a particular, with a band that bands tending to do that, I would, let's say I have a dance that's very percussive in a B part, which is fairly typical for a, a high energy set that you would want to close a half with. What I would do is I, I would, I, first of all, I would have, for, before the evening, presumably have a conversation with the band of, do you like words? Do you want to just see the card? Do you want input from me? Do you not want input from me? Hope they want some input from me. Yeah. But I would turn to the band. I'd, or typically there's a designated person who is selecting tune sets. 
and say, okay, this will be our closer set of the first half. This will be probably the highest energy dance of the evening. It has, I'll say, balances, which is a percussive figure in the Bs. I'd like some sort of driving reels that have percussive Bs. And that could be a convert, that could be one conversation. There are other bands that really prefer to shape their tune around or shape how they're playing their tunes. So they're not necessarily asking me for where the percussion is. They're looking at the dancers, at the dancers. They're listening to the dancers and they're it's like improv. their tune. Yeah. Absolutely. And some of the very best musicians will work, will will basically be hits interacting with the dancers by changing what they're doing based on those percussive steps. So there's another, there's a figure called a, a petronella and very, in some places in the country, dancers will do a particular clumping pattern as part of the move. Originally, this was actually discouraged and considered, no, 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 don't clap, you're, you're interrupting the music. But people really like to clap. It's really fun to clap. <laughs> It um, just feels right. <laughs> and so there'll be musicians who will leave space. They'll just stop playing and let dancers clap and let dancers be part of that musical experience. And for me, that's really the epitome of playing for a dance is it's not a concert. You are interacting with the dancers on the floor. Yeah, so co-creation. One, yeah, that co-creation. Thank you for that word. So that's one kind of very particular way that I would interact with a band. On the flip side, they just might want the adjectives and they'll figure out where those percussive pieces are themselves. And so, again, I might say something along, you know, driving reels, or I might give them a little bit more, some idea of what I'm looking for. And I'm always negotiable on this. I'll say, I really want something dark. Mm. And and um, dark might be a word, or I could say bright. I'd like something bright and airy. And they can put the percussion in there, but I have, the, I have that feel. And bright and airy could also be something in a major key, and dark and moody could be in a minor key. And I might give them some of those pointers as well. And they might capture. They might come back to me and say, oh, well, we just played a, a really you know, bright set of happy jigs. Can we do something moody or darker? And we'll say, absolutely. Um, very typically, most dances and roast tunes get along pretty well. Mm -hmm. And that's really taking it from taking it to that next level of dance trance when you're having those very detailed conversations. Yeah. The mission of the Zeitgeist Academy is simple. I want everyone to live their best musical life. If your dream includes singing with confidence, I got you. I made a mini online course so you can get out of musical drama and finally understand which vocal elements make you sound good. Banish forever those fears of being out of key, off rhythm, and other assorted mayhem. Step into your best musical life, my friends. Sign up for the free course at zeitgeistacademy.com slash radio. So when you're putting your set together, how much of this, like, so you're not building just like, oh, these are fun dances, but you're crafting an entire evening and an experience start to yeah. finish that flows yeah. one into another. It, it's a multi-chapter storybook, and yeah. I really think of it that way. Of you know, we, I am leading dancers on an adventure, on a journey. And where are we going to go on these, this journey? Where are we going to stop? What features are we going to look at? What are we going to encounter along the way? And I try to use my knowledge of the band and of what I know about a community, if it's one that I am typically part of, to try to think about kind of story do they want to be part of what sort of adventures do they want to go on what's going to be fun and straightforward for them what's going to be a little bit of a plot twist and something that they'll have to you know, dig into a little bit to enjoy and when do i really just need to back off and let the band be driving the story i mean that's kind of ultimately your your end goal every dance right is to not be calling anymore <laughs> yeah. just let them do their thing yeah. one of the best compliments i got when i was very early in my calling journey was i had 
been splitting the evening with a more experienced caller. Mm -hmm. And I asked, can I do the first half so I can just relax and dance the second half? And I remember getting off the stage, having finished calling the first half. And there was a, about a 15 minute break for, which is pretty typical people, you know, get a drink and catch up with people. And one of my friends came up to me and said, Hey, did you just get here? I haven't seen you all night. And I went, I had this moment of, <laughs> oh, this is awful. And then I thought about it and I went, you know, I didn't do anything so terrible that my friend had to look at the stage. It's true. <laughs> and wow, good mental pivot there. <laughs> and, and that's one of the fun things is that if you're doing a caller, if you're, you're doing a good job as a caller, you are, should not be center stage. And it's not about you. It's about the experience you're creating. Yeah. And so people say, well, Lindsay, you're a really extreme introvert. How do you do the stage thing? And I said, well, because nobody's looking at me. I mean, if they look at me, something's gone terribly wrong. Right. Right. <laughs> Has anything ever gone terribly wrong? Oh, of course. <laughs> what do you do? And depends on what it is, of course. Um, we, we try to smooth it over. And I often joke that when things go right, it's because the band was awesome. And when things go wrong, it's because the caller was not awesome. <laughs> That, you know, when, when you play a wrong note, it's a variation. And when you call the wrong move, it's incorrect. So yeah, the stakes are a little bit different. Yeah. But to give you a specific example, um, let's say that you have a dance that's a little bit too hard for a group of dancers. And again, in the, there's formations called lines. And let's say you have three lines of dancers, two lines are okay, and one line is just collapsing. And the dancers are around and they're looking nervous. My first goal is to keep people from panic. Mm -hmm. And that can be some sort of audio cue, I see you. Look for your part of the years, because in that, in every time through that pattern of choreography, there's a move called a partner swing. And yeah. if you wait for the partner swing and have everybody swing their partner and then just hang out, the music will roll around back to the point where you're swinging your partner again and it can catch people up. So what I'll try to do is, is reset people. Say, okay, no worries. Swing your partner. Make sure you're facing another group of two across. Again, reset the formation. Wiggle in place. Take a deep breath. Wait for the music. And then I jump back. If I dropped out cueing figures as the music is going, I will jump back in and I will call all the way through as long mm -hmm. as I need to. Mm -hmm. um, just prompting figure after figure to try to reset people. And something that I really, really like to communicate to dancers, both in, over the course of the evening and in introduction sessions, is... Being a good dancer is not about all the moves you remember how to do. Yes. It's about that resilience and that ability to reset. Well, mill around, find your partner, swing your partner, and we can figure the rest. Yes. Yes. Um, I've obviously been on both sides of that. I've been in lines that were doing great and one line was falling apart that was not mine. And then I've been in the line that was falling apart. Um, and just a couple of things that came to mind while you were talking. First of all, um, I mean, even even under you, I've, you've called dances where I've been in lines um, and I didn't even realize maybe one line was falling apart um, because your voice was so calm um, and it just, you know, you didn't stress the rest of us out, even though one line was maybe going crazy, like your voice and your presence um, or other callers as well, like just keeping the calm. Um, so that the rest of the dancers who were doing fine and had you know, maybe something clicked in their line for whatever reason, um, they didn't even know. And then, you know, later at break, they're like, oh, that dance, I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, what are you talking about? That was great. Um, so I think that speaks to to that. And then, and then, yeah, when you're in a line and it is falling apart, my, my relationship, I guess, with Contra right now is at the point where 
I just love it. I'm there because I love to be there. And so it doesn't matter to me. Like Contra is messy. It's not perfect. It's not ballroom or, or Latin or some of these where you're very precise. It's messy. And if it's falling apart, like smile, swing your partner, laugh it off and focus. But don't like get too. some people get very angry or very emotional when they feel like they're doing it wrong. Well, it's Contra. It's OK if you do it wrong. Just try to jump back in when you can. Anyway, those were some some things that I could relate to in what you just said. Totally agree. And that's something that as an experienced dancer on the floor, I also like to try to model yeah. is I make mistakes. And when I make them, I enjoy them. Yeah. Yeah. I laugh, especially if I'm with someone new. I will just I mean, you straight up own it. You're like, oh, that was I, eventually I'll reach a point. I call it contra brain where I just cannot remember anything <laughs> and other people kind of have to like push me. You know, it's at that point where I'm at about 9,900 steps <laughs> into my 10,000 and I just, it's just hit me. It's usually well into the evening. I'm tired physically. Um, and then, I don't know, I call it contra brain. I just can't keep track of the moves. Um, and sometimes people, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, a pretty experienced dancer I still have to have people push me around sometimes just be like that's where you go <laughs> head on down that way um and that's it's just it's okay I love that about contra it's a place where it's okay to just be messy and make mistakes and smile it off and as a caller when you can anticipate when that contra brain sets in you can preemptively jump back on the microphone yes and oftentimes I'll have a, a note on my, my card of choreography that'll say this prompt this move sure but oftentimes it's a really simple move right after a swing that's what people forget and it's not sure. a crazy complicated move it's a move like circle which is really common and really straightforward and it's the one that just goes right out of people's heads so <laughs> If you'll, as you may have noticed, if you're at an event and the caller has already stopped queuing, and then about two thirds of the way through, they jump back on the mic and they just say circle. Yes. Once. Yes. And then they jump off the mic. That's exactly what that is. That's so funny because it's so true. I mean, a, a swing is you're spinning. And if you've been doing this for, you know, two hours, it's a lot of spinning. So maybe it is. Yeah, you're right. That is an area where. And did you come out? You're like, that was so fun. Maybe you're having conversations. That's another thing is you get into conversations with your partner and then come out of it and need to focus back in on the dance. Um, I would love to talk with you a little bit about some of the maybe in the last five to 10 years. We don't have to get super detailed, but some of the changes that have happened in the contra dance community, certainly on the West Coast. I have only danced here on the West Coast. Um, recently. So I don't know what's happening in other areas of the country, but there's been a really big push towards inclusivity, bringing in younger dancers. And I think the West Coast has done overall just an amazing job of, you know, when I started and, and for so long, Contra Dance was, it was a very traditional uh, community that, that had, uh, it was a much older community. And there was a lot of concern. The dances were small. There was typically only one line and then I moved to Portland <laughs> and, and not only have those dances uh, just exploded in the number of people who come, but also the age of the people, um, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, um, you know, it's, it's become so much bigger. What has that been like as a caller and having conversations about some of the changes to the dance itself that has prompted some of the inclusivity? Um, and reaching out to the younger generations? What a great set of questions. And there are a couple different ways to approach this. And I think that the place that I'll start is Contra is still best spread by word of mouth. So you go to the dance, you have a great time. You go home, you tell your roommate, I just had the best time ever. And you make that attempt to describe contra dance and you stumble over the words and you give up and you say, oh, just come with me next. Yep. <laughs> you bring your friend. And the experience that your friend has at the dance is what's going to either encourage them to come back or say, hey, Morgan, this was 
thanks for inviting me, but I this is not what I want to do on Saturday. Yeah. I felt X, Y, and Z, and it wasn't great for whatever reason. And so what are those reasons that it either might be great or it might not be great? And that inclusivity element is such a huge component of that. And it can manifest as the other dancers who you don't know just walking up to you and asking you to dance. You're always able to find a partner. Your partners treat you respectfully and inclusive. They understand where you are at and in your dance trajectory, and they dance to match you. Those are some general community things that you can... And, and that last bit, that would mean like, if you're new, they're not going to add a bunch of new twirls or... Yeah. Um, contra dance can get fairly elaborate. If you're more experienced, you can kind of play with the basic moves. Is that kind of where, where your head was at when you when you mentioned that, is just keeping it in simple? Yeah, precisely. Is that um, one of the other pieces of... of Contra choreography as a sonnet is within each piece of choreography, there are often ways to augment it. And if you're dancing with somebody totally new who's still trying to pick up the basic moves, dance the basic moves with them or ensure that they are enabled to dance the basic move in such a way that they're going to get to their next place on time. Yeah. So that's one element of it. Another element of it is feeling like the dance community is somewhere where you belong. And then something that rather than saying, oh, you know, we need to really drive this to be a youth community, the word that I use is intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And the dances that I find the most compelling are the ones that are really truly intergenerational and mixed. And there's certainly a lower age threshold at which it gets harder to participate. But I want an 11-year-old, and they weren't an 88-year-old to feel equally comfortable at this event. Mm -hmm. And there are ways that communities, callers, organizers, everybody involved can really make that happen. And from the microphone, something that you can do is be very intentional about your language. Historically, there were two dance roles that were gendered in contra dance because it came from other styles of older folk dance, which, again, were gender. And something that has really revolutionized dance over the last 10 years is a move towards non-gendered or gender-free calling, which means that instead of referring to a role by a gender term, we use non-gender terms. Now, so much blood has been spilled and sleep lost and electrons flung over the internet to try to figure out what are the exact right terms. There are spreadsheets there have been so many discussions. They continue to go on. Mm-hmm. And there are two ter- there's a term pair that has been adopted pretty widely at this point, a larks and robins. And the larks start on the left and the robins start on the right. The L and the R, is it the absolute perfect set of terms? No. Do they work well enough to get by with? Absolutely. And I have found myself at the point where I am actually not sure I could go back and call gender anymore because I've really switched everything over. And what's so great about gender neutral dance terms is that if you have a discrepancy of gender, of an imbalance of you know, gender presentation in the hall, um, experienced dancers you'll find often can dance both roles. They may have a preference. And if they're dancing a role that doesn't have a gender affiliated with it, there's significantly less stigma yeah. in switching roles to balance out the hall. You'll often find that with younger dancers, particularly kids, being misgendered really doesn't feel great. And so for kids, taking out any sort of gender language means that they're um, empowered to dance whichever role is actually easier or works better for them based on their height. And there's a role that tends to work a little bit better. It's your shorter. Is that where you find that people tend to uh, to to draw? I'm just curious. I have so many questions. <laughs> Hold on, Morgan, one at a time. <laughs> um, because I do have a preference. I do have. I do tend to want to, you know, follow one particular role. And I wonder if it's just because I'm short. I never even thought about that. <laughs> I like to twirl, 
And that's I'll actually look- the distinguisher that I'll use is people say, well, if, if you're going to introduce dancers to this form and you're not going to give them a, a gender cue, how, how do you encourage them to pick a role? And one of the factors could be how much do you like to twirl? I really, really, really like to twirl. <laughs> so in that case, I'd say if you like to twirl, rob and roll might be a good fit for you. Yep. The other thing that you can do is you can hold out both hands and in, both arms in a neutral position, like as if you're going to hug a barrel. And if they've done some other form of partner or social dance, you ask them to take either take ballroom position with you or to say, if you were to dance with me, how would you hold a partner? And if they default one way or the other, that's how you can start them. Yeah. Okay. The other question that was like bouncing around my head is this switch, um, I think overall has been so positive and I'm just so curious, how do you know when, who to help when a line full of beginners may be falling apart and the dancers certainly don't know who's who coming at them? How are you supposed to know? Who needs help? (laughs) That is a really good question because the first time I actually called it a dance that was truly gender neutral, I didn't realize how anchored I was on looking at the face to determine if someone was in the right spot. There's a fabulous line saying, look for the place and not the face. And so encourage dancers who are, again, more experienced to say, okay, if this move is X many places around, note where you're going to end up and dance with who they're coming at you, where you end up Yes, and make no assumptions. Yes. What I do as a caller is mm-hmm. I assume people are where they want to be. And even if they're not, I'll say dance where you're at. And then again, that partner swing is that moment of reason. Yes. So wander around, even if you end up not where you intended to be. And again, just foster that sense of it's fine. It's a dance. You're supposed to, there's no test at the end, really. But without having, and you had that visual cue of who to look at. And there are some people who will pick a particular person or group of people on the floor who they know which role they're dancing and track that. Um, I don't bother. I will just, okay, there's a group that looks messy. I'll just call the moves for everybody universally and let people sort themselves out. And if they don't have the, if they are you know, new enough that they're not quite sure how to sort themselves out, I am relying on like their dancers on the floor to do that because the best teachers are really your fellow dancers on the floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. So have you ever been at a place where you have this whole set? I mean, it sounds like a, quite a lot of preparation to put a dance together. You have to look at the area who might be coming, uh, the bands that's playing, possibly how experienced or inexperienced that band may be, or maybe you've never worked with them. Um, it's a lot of preparation. Have you ever done all that and then got to the dance and then some, I don't know, let's just say like bachelorette party walks in the door or something like there's a ton of new people and you have to kind of adapt because this happened recently <laughs> at the dance I was at where she had the whole set planned out and then all these new people, I don't know if it was spring break, I don't know what happened, all these college age kids uh, who had never danced before and it was awesome to see them all and I could tell that it was um, not, it was welcome but not expected. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? It happens all the time. And as soon as you started describing it, like the classic busload of group X, yeah. the, the bachelorette yeah. party, the meetup group, the someone hosting students from out of town who may or may not speak English. Oh, boy. You know, there, there's so many examples of this. <laughs> and one of the things that um, I'll jokingly say is I need a program to throw. Sure. So I'll have a baseline that I'll be starting with, and I fully expect to need to change it. I mean, what you're talking is a total step change, reset, swipe everything off, start from fresh. And something that you grow into as a caller is building the repertoire to be able to do that. And it's oftentimes, if you really do have a critical mass of people who are not familiar with the formation and the flow and the figures, 
is you need to back away from that formation and you need to back away from the fingers and you just put everybody in a big circle and you say, hold hands, walk to the left, walk to the right, take four steps into the center and out. Great. That's the dance. Look, that's new. <laughs> yes. And, and actually, them. for those listening who thinks that's boring, that can be really fun. Even if you're experienced, that can be a great time. It's all about the music. And all that's where you, it's where you turn to the band and say, I want your most rockin' set of reels right now. Nice. Break them out. Okay, you wanted to talk about music. Let's do that. Let's go all in here. Let's talk about music. <laughs> where do you want to start? Uh, okay, let's just start with structure, I guess. Um, so you mentioned jigs and reels, and you've talked about the 64-beat pattern. Like, do, are these all traditional tunes? Do they write their own tunes? Let's talk, you know, some of the the bands. There's been so many, uh, so many amazing, amazing contra dance bands. Is that what they do? I mean, I could, I probably should have a, a musician from a, a contra dance band on here. I have so many questions for them too. But, um, you know, are there are there songs that come back that you hear over and over again that are contra dance standards? Um, I don't know. What are some of your favorites? Just start anywhere you like. <laughs> First, I'll say you should absolutely talk to you, at least one musician, hopefully more, because they'll all tell you something slightly different. Yeah. And the magic of contra dance is the variety of music that can be used, that there's what I'll call the, the standard Portland collection that was actually curated by Sue Sauter in the Portland area, put together multiple, I think, four tune she's up to four tune books the Burton collection volume four of a standard repertoire of jigs reels marches and then you could move into say was a little bit more exotic to contra um slip jigs strass bays um, horn types you can really really do a lot with it and you can also take music that is and this is all traditional music some of it's irish scottish Americana, bluegrass, old time, um, Cape Breton, all of these traditions are really common within the contra repertoire. And there are older tunes that really predated contra that either have that 64 beat structure or can be what is called squared, that you change the number of beats in the tune to fit into contra form. And of course, people don't really just stop there musicians will take inspiration from basically anywhere i've called contras to klezmer to katie perry to elton john i've called contras to disney tunes i have not called... danced to i'm trying to think I, maybe they've thrown in they've thrown in a line from a disney tune maybe and like that and does it's really fun like... when musicians just start riffing on something oh, oh man i know that <laughs> It's so good. And it's so just good. like color, just like choreographers are, are writing new sets of dances, musicians are writing new tunes all the time. And yeah. what's really fun is to hear a new tune. And you know, I always go, oh, I don't know that one. What is it? And I'm running up to the band. What is that one? I don't know. It doesn't have a name. I just wrote it last week. <laughs> well, that's a keeper. Yes. And there's certainly tunes that really go through popularity phases and it's really fun to kind of track those and i had the honor of, of traveling nationally to call dances and work with bands that are also traveling nationally and it's always hilarious when they go well i know that over the course of this weekend long dance event i'm fairly sure i'm going to hear these five tunes they're just the trendy ones right now so yeah, you listen to the radio and it's top 40 you know you're gonna hear that song at least once right right yeah, it's uh, as a dancer, it's really fun when that happens because, um, I mean, people will start singing. Yeah, like, just like the, you'll have yeah. the entire dance floor, several hundred people singing to the Beatles or, you know, whatever. Like, they recognize the tune and then they're singing or humming along. Uh, that's that's always fun. Well, Lindsay, I could talk forever with you, but I have one final question. Um. Do you know, so first off, do you know what zeitgeist means? I looked it up. So it means like spirit of the times, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this project, the whole goal behind this project is 
to talk with people from all kinds of different musical subcultures. Um, and every single subculture has something that feels alive to them. That's why you're part of something, um, some kind of subculture, which contra dance is absolutely a subculture <laughs> or, a, or a musical niche, right? So for me, there's like this moment where, where, where music creates an environment where you feel just alive. You feel alive and connected and part of something bigger than yourself. Um, what was a really good zeitgeist moment for you recently? We were going to go back to that dance transport and just kind of lean into that. There's a, a band that I, I work with pretty often, and I knew that they had this particular set of tunes that was actually it has a an m and m riff in it of all things awesome. and i knew that it paired really well with a particular dance in my collection and was able to say okay we're going to put this pairing together at the exact correct moment you know, at the apex of a weekend-long dance event and we were able to put all those pieces together uh, it was the right tune at the right time with the right set of choreography and i waited for the lines of dancers to be particularly long because part of the fun of the choreography was having these really long lines where you could just really you know groove into the music and it's a very driving uh, sort of set of things where you're moving on to a new set of neighbors every couple of beats and being able to put all those pieces together and to create that moment of magic and to have somebody recognize it and come up to me afterwards and say, I'm pretty sure that it was intentional because it's you and I know you plan things and just letting you know it worked. That's awesome. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me on Zeitgeist Radio. Thanks for being on my podcast. Absolutely. I can't believe it's been an hour. I feel like I we're know. just it's... starting to scratch the surface. I, I could absolutely do another hour. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Zeitgeist Radio. To up-level your musical journey and become a music student for life, join the Zeitgeist Academy by signing up for my bi-weekly newsletter. You'll get exclusive content, blog posts, and behind-the-scenes insights. I love putting it together, and you'll love reading it. Head over to zeitgeistacademy.com radio. That's Z-E-I-T-G-E-I-S-T academy.com slash radio. Music for this episode was created by Ian Boswell. Please hit that subscribe button and tell all your friends you found a cool new podcast. See you next time.